and strange grey-green stones. Hello and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Steve Nee Andrews, writer, bookseller, collector, general all-round good guy and culture vulture. And this is a remastered or rather entirely reshot video for something which I covered early in the days of the channel. And I've now removed that video because I wanted to sort of say more about this particular work. Technically, it's going to be the second video in a series I'm going to do about the work of one of my favourite writers, Colin Wilson whose name is popping up more and more on booktube as younger people discover his unique genius. He has a massive oeuvre. I've read at least 70 books by him. He's dead, sadly, now. I met him once, which was a fantastic experience. And I reshot some footage in Wells recently to really showcase one particular story. It is a difficult story to get, but it's very, very interesting, and I urge you to get out there and find it. So this is Colin Wilson, The Return of the Hloigor. The Return of the Floygo is a first-person narrative, focuses around an American academic originally born in Britain who has grown up in the USA, who is an expert on Edgar Allan Poe. He makes a discovery in the Voynich manuscript, which is a real mysterious book from many hundreds of years ago. where he discovers a terror of a particularly traditional kind, something unusual, alien, and yet familiar to readers of horror fiction. And it's done in a way unlike anybody else using this rather traditional form. I say traditional, it's a modern 20th century form, but it's one which would be familiar to many. Much of the narrative is set in this part of Southeast Wales, in Monmouth, Usk, the Black Mountains, and there's a gradual unveiling of the horror at the heart of the book. This part of Wells, of course, has a strong association with horror fiction due to the fact that Arthur Macken, who was born in Carleon, lived not far from here. What is the modern traditional template that Wilson uses in this narrative? H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. Return of the Floygor first appeared in this book, Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos, edited by August Derleth. This is a Grafton edition from the late 80s, which only had one printing then, and I think it's the only UK edition there's ever been in paperback. The Arkham House original was from the late 60s, maybe about 1970, and it's quite uncommon. Um, it's usually around about £35 if you can find it and in really good condition it's a lot more and this was a, a series of mythos stories by different hands including one by Lovecraft and mostly the guys from the early days of the mythos but there is one story in here which I think is the best mythos story I've ever read bar none and that is Return of the Hloigo. Now Return of the Hloigo was updated, revised slightly and reissued a few years later in Village Press in this little chapbook this is the only copy I've ever seen. I've had it for a very, very long time. I bought the Grafton one when it came out. I've had this for at least 30 years. And let me just see the publication date in here. Um, first published in 69 in Tales of Cthulhu Mythos and separate and revised edition in 1974 Village Press. And as I say, it says revised, but I've never noticed many differences. So perhaps it's just sort of punctuation, copy editing and what have you. 
when Pauline Wilson critiqued Lovecraft in his book The Strength to Dream, Durleth challenged Wilson to write a mythos tale that was better than Lovecraft's, if he was such a clever critic. And the fact is, is that Wilson did it. Now, obviously, Lovecraft created things, and the primal creator, the pioneer, I always cleave to. But Wilson's style and skill and ability took the mythos story and raised it to a higher level than any other I've read before. Wilson wrote a number of Lovecraftian things, three novels, this novella. There's a later novella with John Grant, which I've never, ever seen. And it is on Amazon. I should pick it up, really. And I should check that out. That's a bit of an omission in my library. And they're all really good. But this one and the very wonderful Philosopher's Stone, which I'll talk about next time I talk about Wilson, are really the key works in his sort of mythos oeuvre. If you ever see it, snap it up. It's a fantastic story. And the same goes to this whole anthology. I believe that this is in print in the USA and there's a Bantam Trade paperback edition, which I have seen in recent years. And that's an example of Wilson's genius, really. Because of his extensive reading and his work in philosophy, he's able to take popular forms like science fiction and horror and put his own ideas and way of thinking into them, which separates them from the crowd. In the narrative, our protagonist identifies the author of the Voynich manuscript as possibly Roger Bacon, the heretical Christian proto-scientist of James Blish's Dr. Mirabilis. Aside from its overall genius, the one thing that draws me back to the return of the Floyd God to read it again and again is the way in which Wilson reveals one of the key tropes of the subgenre he works in with such elegance and wit and style and cleverness, unlike the ham fisted nature in which it's originated it. We're talking about the Necronomicon. Once at his destination in rural Wales, our protagonist falls in with Colonel Urquhart, an Englishman and Fortean with bizarre theories about Lemuria, Mu, Atlantis. Ultimately, in Return of the Hoigal, Wilson takes rural southeast Wales and turns it into a Lovecraftian milieu, equal of that of New England. After an encounter by the waterside, underneath a bridge, our hero becomes convinced of the reality of the power of the Hloigor and their human instruments. The thing that impressed me the most about Return of the Hloigor when I first read it was the assuredness of style and, as I say, elegance, because that's the only word I can think of that matches Wilson's approach, really, in how he gets the reader through the traditional sort of Lovecraftian part of the story in terms of bringing the central character, the narrator, to his discovery of the Necronomicon. And it's done with such verve and elegance and surety of style that I didn't see it coming. And even though that's a very, very common thing in mythos tales by Lovecraft and by other hands, Wilson just does it better than anybody. And it seems entirely natural, unforced, unpredictable. And when you finally get to that point, you feel a real shudder. It, I can feel my skin rising now thinking about that moment. And as I said, I've read this many, many times and it's the implication and Lovecraft's old saying about the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. Well, in this, Wilson's narrator, Paul, correlates beautifully because he's an academic and he puts all the pieces together and he's skeptical and he's not certain. And when he meets Urquhart, the other main protagonist, who's a very strange character, and he's a bit standoffish um, from, from Paul at first. It, it's just incredibly convincing. And that's the beauty of this. It isn't just a box ticking exercise. It fulfills all the traditional elements that you want from a good old fashioned mythos story with an approach, which is the author's own. And for me, it's the very, very best mythos novella I've ever read. Being from South Wales originally, 
I was quick to notice that there were some inconsistencies, inaccuracies or errors in the text of both versions of the novella in terms of names of the locations that Wilson uses in the story. And I just want to draw attention to them. Fundamentally, the story takes place in a number of locations. Newport is mentioned, and of course Newport is South Wales' second city. It's to the east of Cardiff, and it was a major dock, and it's sort of a declined sort of town and has been for a long time. It's only about 10 or 15 miles from Cardiff. And to get to where the main sort of action of Return of the Hoiger is set, you would get a train at that time to Newport. In the story, the nomenclature goes wrong because at one point it's referred to as Newport and another time as Southport. Now this dual naming of Newport and Southport was either a error in copy editing and Wilson meant to correct it and to use Southport as a fictional synonym for Newport because of course there isn't a Southport in South Wales. Southport the, is in, um, let's see, I think it's at the Wirral, I think it's Liverpool area. It's also possible, of course, that it was part of Wilson's sort of trickster aspect in telling the story. And the character takes a train to Newport from London when he's on his quest and then takes a train from Newport to Carleon. Carleon is duplicated in the story and also comes up under the name Melincourt. And this is where most of the action takes place. It's a small country town. Melincourt is a synonym, a fictional synonym for Carleon. And of course, it suggests Merlin's court. Merlin in Welsh was Merthyn. And it is reputed that there was an Arthurian court at Carleon. And that goes way, way, way back. So it's the implication of something Arthurian there. And also Wilson chose Carleon, Melincourt in the story, because Arthur Macken was born there and grew up in that area. And that's what draws the narrator, Paul, to that area initially. Excited to be walking towards Macken's house, which is painted a very fetching pink. You'd have thought that um, oh, Macken interiors, interesting. It's obviously a business now. I was under the impression that it was a museum these days. And um, as you see, it's pink. You'd have thought that a Fandasikel yellow would probably be more appropriate. Author of the novel of the Black Seal, the Great God Pan. The White People, inspiration for everybody from M. John Harrison to H.P. Lovecraft. It's the Mackin connection that draws Paul, the narrator's story, to Carleon because Mackin was an influence on Lovecraft. And as the narrator is an academic who is a Poe expert and Chatterton expert, he has come across Mackin, but Lovecraft is too sort of recent for him because he's a bit of an antiquary, which again is a kind of M.R. James sort of thing. So he's a fusty old sort of academic guy who doesn't bother with anything too modern. Aside from the confusing references to Southport and Newport, the same place, which I believe is just a copy editing thing, there's another place referred to called Llandalflan, which a key incident occurs. Now, I don't know that area of Wells really, really well, but I've tried to check it out. And as far as I'm aware, there is not a place called Llandalflan. It doesn't exist. So Wilson has made this up. Other than that, his geography of that part of South Wales and the way Paul, the character, explores South Wales in a car is really, really good. And all the directions and the east, the south, the west, everything is absolutely correct. So perhaps there's a little bit of playfulness in there as well, because it is a playful book in some respects.
something that Wilson excels at is realism and matter-of-factness. And there's an awful lot of incidental detail in the story, names of places, of people that the character knows, little details, and sometimes characters are only referred to once, his acquaintances and fellow academics refer to once, but it creates this sort of picture of real veracity. A world is built up around this character, which is entirely convincing, and it fits beautifully with Wilson's very clear, pellucid prose and his strength at making arguments. And it's absolutely fascinating the way he delineates the character through these connections. It's the very elegance with which he approaches the mythos, which is what makes Return of the Loigo so special. The whole problem for me now with the mythos is that everybody and their grandmother knows who Cthulhu is, even before they've read the stories. And it's kind of this focus on that, which is part of the problem. And the subtlety is, is lost. And yeah, Lovecraft wasn't very subtle. A lot of his copyists weren't very subtle. But Wilson is. And in taking this outre material, these weird stories, and putting it into a frame using this character and his profession and how he digs into and uncovers what's really going on in the world of the mythos is just absolutely amazing it's sublime so if you can pick it up please do try and get the bantam edition from the usa because there's other good stories in there as well and i have mentioned this before somewhere i don't know i've got it somewhere there was a new tales of cthulhu mythos which has got such wonderful things in it by people like stephen king um, and lots of other less familiar names and there's some great stories in that as well so try and get tales of cthulhu mythos so you can read the return of the Floygo. So there you go, I've set you off on your own trail of Cthulhu now in search of an obscure story and a difficult to obtain book, but I hope you have fun tracking it down and when you pick it up and read it, wait for that moment when you discover the way to the Necronomicon. This is Stephen e. Andrews, Outlaw Bookseller. Please subscribe, like, comment and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.